Good afternoon. It is Saturday and they started out with a nor'easter, lots of cloud, might rain, might not rain. And now it has swung around to the northwest, which is where our warmest weather comes from. And the sun has come out, so it is time to get on and do something outside. I am going to remove all the stays and pegs off the posts because the concrete's had a couple of days now and uh, should be all set. So I'll get on with it. It seems it doesn't matter whether you are building a shed, a fence or even a multi-storey building. There is always a greater sense of progress when you finally start above ground level. Whether the foundations you are building are in construction or in life, whatever foundation you build on will ultimately determine if what comes after remains stable. I acknowledge that maintenance of what is built on the foundation is important, but if you look at the ruins of Europe, even if the structure has been abandoned for many years and is in a bad state, as long as the foundation is sound, they do rebuild them. There are important life illustrations in this. Removing all the stays and pegs was a mostly straightforward task. I had driven some of the screws in a bit too far on the stays and whilst they unscrewed from the posts and the pegs easily, it took a bit more work to extract them from the stays. Once I had done all that and stowed them all away in the timber rack, ready for the next project. I was reflecting on the blessing of the wood rack as I put things back into it. At the time, building the rack was a bit like sharpening the saw or replacing the chisel or whatever. It can seem like wasted time when you are doing it, as you are not actually achieving the project at hand. However, the result is much more effective when the tools are sharp. Building the timber rack was like that. Digging out for the board at the bottom here, when I started to dig this bit out to accommodate the board, I had only brought down my normal spade. I quickly realised that due to the multitude of tree roots that I was going to need the draining spade. Once I did that, things progressed a lot faster. The bottom end of the fence, or this lower end probably is a better way to describe it, is over some land that is quite uneven in every way. This meant that I had to cut pieces out of the boards to accommodate both the fence rail of the existing fence and also, as you will see later, to go over the concrete at the bottom of one of the posts. That won't matter as there is no real horizontal load on these boards. My main purpose in having these boards at ground level is to stop as much as is possible, the creepers and vines coming through from the next door wilderness. Due to this changing slope of the ground, I will end up with a join of all of these boards at this post. Over the next 12 to 15 metres up the fence, I think the slope will be the same, and therefore I will be able to stagger the joins in the different height boards on different posts. This will add to the lateral strength of the fence.
I think I've had enough for today. Uh, <clears throat> particularly uneven ground down here and fences going in different directions and things. So what I've done is I have put ever such a slight bend in that there to get it around and onto that post. So where that string line is going, that's where the boundary is. And so if I come back here, you can probably see there's just an ever such slight bend in there. But that is in part because I need to go around that tree and because of where I need to put this post. But I'm quite happy with that. So I'm thinking, I'm hoping that <clears throat> this is the trickiest part maybe is the right word uh, it is my intention to dig the retaining boards into the ground all the way up here but if I walk over here you'll see that that is from that point that I've gone to it's a much more even slope up through there so that won't require bits of board underneath and things like that down there where there's that gap I'm going to fill that and, and raise the level of the ground at that point so <clears throat> enough for today it'll take me 20 minutes or so to pack everything up and it's heading towards 5 anyway and the sun is going down so trying to do anything more with not enough light is not a good plan alright I have oh, just I have now banged that peg in. Uh, the reason I didn't bang it in before obviously was because there was a big hole next to it. <clears throat> but now that that big hole's got it's been filled with concrete, the peg has been put where it should be. I'll see you another day. Bye. Good morning. I'll just show you something up here. I don't know whether you can see it, but right on the top of the tree, right there, is a wood pigeon looking down at me. And just below him, about there somewhere, there's a tui in the tree as well. They're feeding on the, well, the wood pigeon is feeding on the berries up there. We'll leave him to it. Anyway, that's not what uh, I'm doing this morning. Uh, today is the day to try and um, retrieve, resurrect the two cherry trees that we had on the bank that the cyclone <coughs> dealt to. So the first one I'm going to do and probably all I might get done this morning, we'll see. The, the weather is supposed to deteriorate as the day goes on and then get better tonight but what I'm planning to do is to retrieve this cherry tree that's down here so that's the top of it and then it, the, the root ball is just about there and obviously that's on a at least a 45 degree slope and uh, so it it could be a little bit tricky, we'll see what happens. I'm thinking I will tie a rope to it um, near, the, near the root ball and then tie that rope to a post up the top here because that will mean that A, the tree is secured from falling down the hill further and also will uh, give me something to hang on to so that I don't fall down the hill as well. So I will get on with that and we'll see what happens.
You can hear the tuis in the trees above me, but also the call of the chainsaw in the distance. The wood pigeon, or to give it its proper New Zealand name, or Māori name, is the kiraru. It was coming and going from the tree all day. In the background you may hear the whooshing sound of them flying in and away from time to time. The chainsaws are still an almost daily phenomenon as people are still clearing up post cyclone. You can also hear the big digger moving about across the road. They are working on restoring the bridge across the stream so that the five families that live on the other side, I think there are only three over there at the moment, will have their vehicle access restored. That is still a while away going by what I've observed down there today. I decided that two ropes would be better than one. One for the tree and the other for me. As you will see I used the yellow rope for me. It is slightly thicker and also it has better texture for me to be able to grip onto it and pull myself back up. The tree was really only hanging on by one large root near the surface at the top. The other smaller roots were probably providing nourishment but not a lot in the way of stability. Once I had cut the large root it more or less fell off the bank. I was keen to maintain as many of the other roots as possible so I just pulled it free. Once I had done that it was a matter of bringing the tree, the spade and me back up the bank. It was initially a bit of a struggle to progress the tree up the bank, but once I had it over some tree roots that were protruding, it was mostly straightforward. Due to a lack of a sizable root ball, it wasn't that heavy, meaning I could actually pick up the whole lot with one hand once I was up on a flat plane. I brought the spade up separately and then moved my rope connection higher up so that I could gain better stability as I pulled the tree up. Initially I had just tied the rope around the trunk of the tree but once I had it free I ran the rope around the root ball and, well to better support it while I dragged it up the hill. Once I had the tree at the top I then had a bit of a rope mess to sort out to extract the tree from the rope. In hindsight given that it wasn't that heavy it may have been easier to take the tree down to the drive and then just carry it back up. I was reluctant to do that because I didn't know what I was dealing with initially and it seemed counterintuitive to go down when I needed to go up. Oh, he huffed and he puffed and the cherry tree is now up where it is going to go so now I need to go and dig a hole for it so I can plant it. Next step. Kathy and I had previously agreed where the trees were going to go, hence the white pegs. Considerations were aesthetic, as in symmetry, and also practical in that this one will screen us to some extent from the house above. The neighbours have planted quite a lot of trees and it won't be an issue in a few years when they have grown a bit. Today it's just a matter of digging the hole for this tree and planting it. Digging holes in this area of the property is different from further down the section as there is a reasonable depth of topsoil up here. I suspect that many years ago there was extra soil deposited here when they developed the section and built the house on the other side of the hedge. The evidence for this is that there are always findings. I'll elaborate on that a bit later. I noticed that there were quite a few roots that had lumps of clay around them. 
As I was removing them, I was reminded of dagging sheep for some reason. For any of you familiar with sheep farming, the saying to rattle your dags, to encourage someone to move more quickly, may well be familiar. It's one of those terms that, for those not of an agricultural bent, may seem a bit gross, and this is why. Sheep, left to their own devices, will deteriorate, as they aren't really capable of looking after themselves. What happens is that as their wool gets long, their excrement gathers in the wool at the rear of the sheep. This is what are called dags. This then hardens and becomes hollow to some extent. This means that when the sheep run, the dags bang together and rattle, hence the term. Farmers deal with the dags by removing the wool from that area, it's called crutching, and they may also remove the wool around the face to restrict the transmission of parasites and other things from the ground when the sheep are grazing, to stop things like facial eczema and sheep measles, which isn't measles but that's another story. Once I had checked the hole was the appropriate size, I found a couple of fencing standards to use as stakes. It's quite a good idea to put the stakes in first, you are less likely to damage the tree roots that way. I then put the tree in place, tied it to the standards, before filling the soil back into the hole, making sure that it went around all the roots as much as possible to give the tree the best chance of surviving. And there we have it, in its new position. Is it going to survive? I don't actually know. And there's a raindrop on the lens, hang on. There we go, that might be better. I have intentionally left a little uh, trench there, if you like. Um, because it is spitting, so that's kind of perfect timing, really. Uh, not that I had anything to do with that, but... And we will have to see whether it comes away again in the springtime. Whenever I dig up here, it's always an adventure. So I think I've mentioned before that the big house up, up there, not too many years after it was built, it had a big fire. Now we're talking early 20th century stuff. Well, first half of anyway. So probably 30s, 1930s, somewhere around there. And all the ran, land around here, our section, over into Lang Cove, uh, this other one, Busby Hill, but the next one here, they were all owned by that big property up there. So when they had the fire, and this was all farmland basically, when they had the big fire, <coughs> they did what farmers do, in that you just chuck all the broken bits down and down the paddock a bit, down the hill a bit. And so I'm forever finding bits of tile that I'm not quite sure what that is, it's a bit thick to be a plate and it has a has a hole in it there. It may have even been part of a, um, a sink or something, in fact it's got two, no idea. Anyway, uh, so, but I didn't find any bricks this time. Further up, when I dig up, up near the fence there, there are always bricks. Uh, and that's why I had the draining spade handy because there the draining spade's better for prizing those out of the ground. That's it for now. As you can tell from the blue sky, the rain, quote unquote, uh, lasted no time at all. In fact, it didn't really rain, it just a few drips here and there. So lunch has come and gone, and so I've decided I will see if I can retrieve this other tree that you can see in the background here lying on its side and take that up the top and hopefully maybe even get it in the ground today so that's the plan we'll see how it goes
Okay, this trunk is three times the size of the other one. So this might be a bit more work, I think. One thing the extra moisture has done has enabled the weeds to uh, go crazy. I'm beginning to wonder about the feasibility of this. That's quite a big tree. Well, <laughs> I mean, I realize it's not a big tree, but <clears throat> it's a... Uh, it's a sizable one to be digging out and trying to uh, establish it somewhere else. <clears throat> but it probably can't stay here anyway because <clears throat> we are going to have to redo the retaining wall up here. Now the thought is that although that tire wall has actually not moved at all um, that we that we need to put a retaining wall in down here now and whether this would be able to remain under that scenario I'm not sure so I'll see if I can get it out and then we'll go from there it's quite a sizable route down there that is going to be going quite a distance so I think what I'm going to do I'm going to try and straighten the tree up and restake it and leave it for now okay change of plan the videography on this wasn't great sorry about that I had the GoPro on a head strap but of course I couldn't see what was being recorded. There was a reasonable amount of working in head high vegetation and clambering up and down the bank. Earlier I referred to weeds that were growing very well. Really it was the acanthus mollus, which technically isn't a weed, but I've covered that previously. I changed my mind a couple of times as to whether to move the tree or not. You will probably work out from the video that I used a couple of ratchet tie downs between the cabbage tree at the top of the bank and the cherry tree to pull the tree upright. Once I had the tree upright I realized that it wasn't going to work to leave it where it is because there wasn't a way to keep it stable with stakes and the ground it is growing in is very friable making it hard for the roots to give a good footing. It wasn't a straightforward task to dig the tree out either, as I discovered there were quite a few concrete blocks buried just under the surface. That must have been me at some part in the dim dark past, I think before the tree was actually planted. The roots had struggled to grow in that direction because of the concrete. In the end, I used the tie downs to pull the root ball out of the ground. The struggle wasn't helped by the fact that some of the roots had wound themselves around the metal stake and it took me a little while to realize that. The downside of the soil being so light was that very little of it came with the root ball, despite the fact that I had dug all the way around to a depth of the draining spade. It just all fell apart when I pulled it up. You can see how friable the soil is by how easily I was able to pull the stake out. Once I had carried the tree up the drive and onto the lawn, 
I then made a bad decision as to the best way to take it up the hill to where it was going. I got there in the end, but it would have been so much easier if I'd just gone straight up the steps and along the path. Ho oh, hum, hindsight. Time for a rest. When the tree was in its original position, the bank rose quite steeply directly behind it. This meant that some of the large tree roots were actually going up at about a 45 degree angle. Unfortunately, there wasn't really a way that I could accommodate these and retain them, so I had to cut them back and hope that they regrow. The tree is moved. Now because it's quite a windy spot here and this tree has a lot more sail than the other one so I've got it tied off to that post there to this post here and also up over there. It is good to have the two trees in, one there and one over there as you can see it's it's quite a bit larger. That last hole digging for the last tree proved to be a bit of an archaeological dig. There'd obviously been a fire pit up there at some point I think. This looks like a bit of uh, mm, it's glass I think. Quite glass. Probably a jar of some sort because there's a bit of a thread on there. So probably a cosmetic one or something like that. A bottle. I don't actually know what those bottles are for. Hard to know. What does it say on the bottom? Ah! <laughs> Disprin! There you go. That's what that was. And this looks a bit like the front of a mouth organ. I think that's probably what that is. This is some kind of a... Oh, it's a knife. So the handle would have been here, a bone handle would have been here, and then the blade would have gone down there, but somebody broke it. So it got biffed. This, I think, was probably... Judging by the... I don't think it was a nugget tin. I think it was probably a Rawley's tin or something like that with Rawley's ointment in it. And there was a penny also. So this is a New Zealand one penny, King George VI, so 1945, so I think you can see that there hopefully, um, yes, the year that World War II ended, a significant year, so you probably won't keep it, but there you go. Archaeology at its finest. This uh, <clears throat> this may be the end of this video. I really don't know. But if it is, <laughs> hope it was entertaining. I have yet to look at any of the video uh, from today. So, uh, particularly this afternoon and trying to get that tree out. Uh, that could be a bit of fun. Okay, bye.